we've been going through our uh, Ephesians uh, sermon thing for like, I don't know, four or five months now. And so we have a couple more weeks. And so if you haven't gotten it yet, God's blueprint and God's design, his gospel design is for all of life. And I think so often we think that our salvation and restored relationship with God is just a Sunday thing maybe, or it's also a Sunday thing and a once I die for the rest of eternity thing. But his transformation in our hearts and lives has implications for every single day of the week and for every relationship in our lives. And so for the last couple of weeks, we've been exploring some of those relationships and it hasn't been comfortable. Amen. Wives and husbands a few weeks ago. And then we talked about children and parents. And then last week, fathers to kids. And so today it's going to get more personal and we're going to talk about work and how God has a gospel design and blueprint for our workplace even. And so maybe your workplace is a place that you try to keep separated from the rest of your life. You're like, I do church, I do family, I do me time, and then there's work. Preacher, don't talk about work. Maybe work is a place that you've separated from your faith, that somehow your faith doesn't apply when you get to work on Monday morning, that there are a different set of rules for work than there are for home or for church. Maybe work is a place that we run to for escape. When the rest of life is crazy, I'll go to work and shut the rest of that out. I know nobody can relate to anything I'm saying right now. Maybe work's a place that you try to find significance and security. Or a place that you try to get some control and some power. And let me tell you, that's a great place to feel like you're getting those things. Or maybe work is something you try to avoid at all costs. Work is something that you dread. God wants to talk to us today about this. Through his word, by his spirit, um, and just like we've said every week, it doesn't matter if you have a job or not. So kids, teenagers, young adults, listen. Um, there is something here that you need for all of life that you, every single one of us, can put into practice when we leave this place today. There's something rich that we need to wrestle with here. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump in. Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you that though uh, it was penned by different men over thousands of years on different continents, it was all guided by your spirit, and it is just as applicable and life-giving and relevant to us today as it was then, because that's the power of your word and the power of your spirit. And so thank you that you are speaking to us today and you have something for each of our hearts. So Lord, no matter where we are with work, um, no matter what that word brings up in us, in our, in our head, and our hearts, I thank you that you have something to speak to us about it today. And so Lord, open our hearts to you, amen. So I really need you and want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6 with me. If you have your Bible or even on your phone or iPad, um, go ahead and turn with me. We only have a couple more weeks in Ephesians, like I said, and then we're going to be going to something else as we prepare for Christmas and the Advent season. But today is Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 5. And in the Bible, you'll notice that there are these little headings where they've broken up the text, the, the text and, the, and the scripture, uh, kind of these thematic headings that weren't there originally. God didn't inspire these headings, but they're typically good summaries. And so depending on what your Bible says in the heading, it says bond servants and masters or slaves and masters. And so the first verse, the first word of verse five is bond servants or slaves. And so if you looked at that and heard the record screech like, <laughs> like what? What are we talking about slaves and masters? Is, is Paul condoning slavery here? Is the Bible talking about slavery? Is this somehow okay? Paul's been talking about all of these other relationships like they're okay. How come he has this section here about bond servants or slaves and masters? Um, slavery is not the point 
of this passage, and it can cause us to miss what is being said, but I also don't want to ignore it and skip over it because it is important. So I'm going to address it briefly. But slavery in the text of Scripture could be a whole other several sermons. But here's a flyby. Um, the issue in practice and history of slavery is not foreign to the Bible. Old Testament and New, you will see slavery mentioned in reference. It was part of God's own people's story. For the Israelites, the Jewish people, they were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. Other times throughout their history, they were enslaved by other people. Um, God never instituted it or condones it, although he does throughout Scripture give instruction for it. And you're gonna, we're going to see that in this passage a little bit. But for instance, Exodus 21, God gives very clear instruction that humans were not to be kidnapped. They were not to be sold. They were not to be abused. Deuteronomy 23 says that fugitive slaves were not to be returned to their masters. And so slavery oftentimes in the Bible isn't like what we know in our own country of slavery. Slavery in the Bible had all different aspects. Um, slaves were often prisoners of war. And so in some ways to be enslaved was a merciful thing. If you were a conquered people, instead of wiping you out, you had the option of being enslaved. Um, other times it was a voluntary thing. They didn't have bankruptcy back in the day. So you could, it's called indentured servitude, that I would make myself a slave to a family or to an individual in order to pay back my debt. The terms would be agreed upon, how long. Uh, other slaves, many earned a wage. Many were able to earn their freedom uh, after a certain amount of time. Slavery was often temporary, and it was not largely based upon race, as again, our American slavery was. And so um, some slaves had really good lives. Again, it depended on the master. Maybe you had a really kind master and your servitude went okay. Others were horribly mistreated. Slaves didn't have a lot of rights and it depended on what country or what region they were in. Um, many times it was just the will and whim of their master how they were treated and some were treated horribly. Aristotle said a slave is a living tool just as a tool is an inanimate slave. Shows you what his perspective was. And so let me be very clear, what the Bible is clear about from beginning to end is that the degrading and devaluing of any human is absolutely detestable to God. All of us are created in his image, in the womb, outside of the womb, from any country of any time of any people group, everybody is equally of value to God, amen? So, okay, Matt, I kind of get that, but this part, he's putting this section in with these other relationships that he says are good things, wives and husbands. Like, is he saying this is okay, that, that God intended, his, God's design was for slaves and masters to be a thing? Is that what is, that what is happening here? Um, no, when Paul discussed the wife and the husband relationship, remember that he tied it to the eternal relationship of Christ and his church. He said explicitly, this is why God created marriage to point to the greater reality of the relationship the church is to have with Jesus Christ. So that was a good thing and he gave us the reason for it. Secondly, when he discussed the child and parent relationship, he said the words, this is right. And then he quoted the fifth commandment showing that the child and parent relationship is part of God's natural order and design for the family. So he validated both of those things, that those are part of God's design. You will notice as we read through this, Paul doesn't give any sort of tie-in like that. He doesn't validate the institution of slavery by any means. He just gives instruction for how the two are to interact. He's not condoning or encouraging it, but he is addressing how to live as Christians in the midst of a cultural construct that was present in their day. So... If you haven't noticed, Paul and Jesus and other Christians of the first century did not mount a political movement or campaign to abolish slavery or pick any other issue. They didn't do it politically, yet they consistently combated and undermined it by upholding the gospel. That Jesus came to bring the freedom that we all need from sin and that we are all created in the image of God equal in value and dignity. 
You know that Jesus consistently broke cultural norms as he walked the earth in the way that he elevated women who had little to no value in the day. He elevated the role of children and the value of children. And he constantly and consistently elevated the oppressed by the way that he interacted with them in love and respect, in physical touch, and in care. And so that's Paul's aim as well, that as the gospel transforms our hearts, it will absolutely transform the, transform the way we treat one another. I wish I could say more. I got to keep going. So why is Paul addressing bond servants and masters within these other household relationships? Husbands, wives, parents, children, fathers, children. Why is this one included? History tells us that were, there were approximately 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire at this time. So that means about half of the population of the Roman Empire was enslaved in various ways to the other half of the population. It's just what it was. It's how their society functioned. And so remember, their slavery then had a lot of nuance, but it was the culture and the economy of how the empire ran. Slaves then were part of the household. A slave didn't do their time and then go down the street to their house. Slaves lived in the home. They lived with the family. They weren't done at the end of their shift. Slaves in this culture and context were part of the family unit in that sense. And so you have, as Christianity is spreading, as the gospel is spreading, you have both slaves and masters coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And so now they have this new way of living. They're a new man. No longer is there Gentile and Jew or slave and free. They are being made one in Christ. And so how were they to live differently in light of that? In the midst of a culture that still had these constructs. And so though slavery isn't exactly the same as the employee and employer relationship we have in our culture, the principles and instruction that Paul gives us in these few verses, I think 100% apply to those that are in a leadership position as a boss in some way and those who are employees. We're going to see the principles that apply. And so in this room and those watching, we have business owners, we have business partners, we have managers sitting here. We have middle managers sitting here. We have supervisors. We have full-time employees. We have part-time employees. We have minimum wage employees in this room. We have unemployed people within our church right now. How does God call us to engage by his gospel design in our workplace given all those different relationships? Is that interesting to you at all? These are dynamics all of us face in different ways on a daily basis, and the gospel speaks to it. So here we go. Verse 5, Paul is going to address, we're, we're going to call it the employee, bond servant or slave. He's going to address them first. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters. So that's the same word he used for children to parents. Children, obey your parents. So he's pointing to there's an authority structure here we're to honor. Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling, why? Because he can fire me? With a sincere heart. You mean I can't just do my job, I have to have a good attitude about it? I have to like really want to do a good job at work? That's what it says. Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart. Why? as you would Christ. I have to obey my boss like I would obey Jesus? And Paul would say, yes. Matt, I think you're taking that a little far. I think you're twisting it a little bit. Well, just to make sure that we get it, Paul says the exact same thing three more times in different ways. not by the way of eye service as people pleasers. So not just working when the boss is watching or is around or when other people are observing my work, not just doing a good job then, but as bond servants of Christ. There it is again. I do my work as though I was a servant of Christ. 
doing the will of God from the heart. There it is again. He's saying that my work is actually doing the will of God. God's will for me is to do my work well, and not only to do my work well, but from the heart. As always, God is after our hearts, not just the performance of a duty or a task. He wants you to do your work for your boss as though you were working directly for him because he's saying you are and the way in which you do that, the condition of your heart in which you do that matters to me. If you're feeling uncomfortable, good. We should. Verse 7. Rendering service with a good will. There's the heart thing again. As to the Lord. He just said the same thing again. Not to man. My work in this day as a slave is to be done really well for my master because ultimately he's telling me it's I'm serving Christ. And not only that, I can't get away with just doing my job good. I have to have the right heart or attitude about it that my work is unto the Lord. It doesn't matter if my boss is an oppressive jerk. I'm to work as unto the Lord. Now, if you're like me, you're saying, how do I do that? You don't know what my work environment is like. Matt, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're a pastor. You don't even have a staff. You don't have a boss right now. Touche. <laughs> Verse 8. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. So Paul's saying like, if you do this with a right heart motive, as you, as you work as unto the Lord and, and not whether or not you think your boss deserves you to do a good job, if you do that as unto the Lord, no matter what your work situation is like, God sees it and he is the one who will honor it. Whether you are a slave or free, there's no partiality with the Lord. God didn't just have the back of those who were free and trying to do a good job. He's like, slaves, I got you too equal in value and dignity. Now, there's a passage in Colossians. It's another letter that Paul writes to another church at another time where he covers these same issues. It's like the, a very similar thing that he addresses. He addresses wives and husbands and children. He does it much more concisely. And so he has these two verses there that sum up what we just read him, heard him say four different times. He says it in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, Whatever line of work you're in, whatever you do for work, whatever you do, work heartily. There's the heart thing again. As for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. I don't know about you. How often when you get up to go to work, or maybe you don't go to work anymore, you do it at, uh, from bed, uh, how often when you open your laptop do you think, I am working today for Jesus? All these conference calls, all these reports, all these terrible meetings I have to have, I am working today for Jesus Christ. Probably not your first thought. But if the word of God is true, that is what we were just told four times is that our work, no matter what we do, is meant ultimately to be done as unto the Lord, as if we were working directly for him, and our heart condition in that matters. Well, again, Matt, how do I do that? Well, I'm going to share a little personal experience because it's an area where the Lord really corrected me. I haven't been a pastor forever. For the last little bit, yes. Um, through high school, college, and seminary, into my mid-20s, I worked different jobs. My parents never let me work retail. They really wanted me to do jobs where I would learn a trade or different things. And so I'm grateful for that. Um, 
but I did roofing, I did remodeling, I worked at an orchard, I did driveway sealing, which was miserable, the black tar stuff, oh my gosh. Um, I've done all kinds of landscaping, I worked for a catering and event company in Virginia Beach when I was in seminary, did that. Um, I had mostly good bosses in all the different jobs I worked, um, but the, the hardest job and the nastiest job I ever had was in a restaurant, you've heard me reference this before, probably. Um, Waiting tables is absolutely terrifying for a shy introvert. I legit would have nightmares <laughs> when I worked at this restaurant. Um, it was terrible. But not only was I stressed out because I wasn't really shy and an introvert, um, but some of my coworkers were hostile toward me. And then one of the owners and one of my bosses straight from Naples, um, he was really nasty. We're pretty sure he had a Coke problem. Um, kids, that means he drank too much Coke. Um, but I dreaded going to work when he was the manager on shift because he would just ride me. He would just pick at me. He would make fun of me in different ways. He would just harass me. And I just dreaded it and I would hate it. And I didn't want to go to work, didn't want to go to work. Um, and so one day God corrected me. And Maybe you've had these occasions where you feel like the Holy Spirit just kind of smacks you upside the head, like, hey. And I kind of felt, I didn't hear a voice or anything, but I kind of felt him ask me, why do you have this job? My first gut response was, well, to make money. I'm a college student, I need money. And it was like I heard the Lord say, nope. And maybe you're here and you're thinking, why do I have my job? Well, I want to provide for my family. The Bible talks about, like, you got to, you got to take care of your family. If you don't, you're worse than an unbeliever. But I think what we're reading today is that the highest aim of having a job is not getting money. And so the Lord that day, why do you have this job? To make money. He said, nope. And I felt him say, you're, the reason you have this job is to bring glory to me. You're like, well, that sounds churchy. Um, the truth is, is that you and I could work anywhere, but God gave me that job at that time with those coworkers on purpose. If you believe in a sovereign God, that is an implication of what sovereignty means. That wherever you are, he has you there, not by accident or by chance, on purpose for his reasons, ultimately, always, no matter what we do for his glory. And I began to feel like he was saying, your job in this terrible situation in many ways is not about you making money. It's for you to bring me glory by being a light for me in this dark place. To my knowledge, there were no other Christians on that wait staff or in the, in the restaurant. The things that they would talk about were horrible. And when I felt like the Lord corrected me and convicted me of my bad attitude and my wrong motives and my complaining and everything, from that day forward, I had a completely different perspective on my job there. It wasn't always easy. There were still days that I didn't like it, but my heart toward that job completely changed. And I began praying for my coworkers, not going up and laying hands on them in the middle of a shift, but in my heart and in my spirit, as I was waiting for a table, I would begin praying for my different coworkers. They were talking about the weekend they had and all the junk they were doing, so I had lots of prayer requests to pray for, whether they knew it or not. I knew the issues my managers were going through. I would pray for that. And I just remember as I was, I don't know, 19, and I was probably there when I was 21, 22, I was praying like, Lord, would you just show up here? Would you bring your glory here? And I don't know what I was expecting. But when... He got a hold of my heart in a different way and I saw it differently, everything changed. And so I'd ask you today, why do you go to work? Why do you have a job? Does your perspective need to change in some ways like mine did that, mine did that day? I've worked at a church for a long time and I gotta tell you, my heart would very quickly be distracted and my heart would be about other things instead of why I had a job there. Do your coworkers know you're a Christian 
Not necessarily because you bring your Bible on your lunch break or you drop things, but would they know you were a Christian by your attitude and by your work ethic? Do you work your job as if Jesus was standing next to you in your workplace? Do you give your job your full attention, your full heart, as unto the Lord for his glory? That's what he calls us to do. Okay, boss, it's your turn and we're wrapping up. Those of you that are here that are responsible for other people, maybe you're a business owner or a manager of some, of some sort, if you have people under your care, this last verse is for you. He says, Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. He says, masters, do the same to them. He, he's not meaning like masters, obey them like I just told them to obey you. But he's saying is, do your job well as unto the Lord. When you look at leadership throughout the Bible, biblical leadership is servant leadership. No matter the business, God has entrusted people to your care and you are to lead them to help them become what God created them to be. That is not just for church and for ministries and people over here like me. If God has entrusted people to your care, just like your wife and your children, like we've been talking about, then you are held responsible for how you develop and interact and care for those people. Are you with me? He has put you in that role with those people, with that responsibility, in that workplace, at this time, for a reason, to point to him and his glory. And so employers, I would ask you the same thing. Do, you, do your employees know that you're a Christian? If you never mentioned the word Jesus, would they be shocked to find out that you are a Christian? Do you treat them as Christ treats you? Do you treat all of your employees with dignity and respect that God has put into them by nature of being created in his image. I'm not saying that that means you let everything slide. I'm saying how you engage them, how you hold them accountable is your character and your interaction with them reflective of Christ's heart for you and the way that he leads you. In a couple weeks, we're going to do a series for Advent in the book of Ruth, which may feel like a stretch, and we'll see. <laughs> I've never preached through Ruth before. Um, but I was reading through it this week with the kids, and one of the main characters in the book of Ruth is a man named Boaz. And Boaz is an incredibly wealthy man who owns lots of fields and has many employees. And as I was reading it this week, this one verse stood out to me. It's Ruth chapter 2, verse 4. Boaz showed up at the office that day. In other words, he showed up at his fields where all his employees are. And the Bible literally says this. As he showed up at the field, it says, And he said to the reapers, his employees, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. And I laughed because I'm like, How healthy of a work culture is that? Boaz wasn't a priest or a prophet. He was a farmer, basically, a business owner. And yet he had respect for his employees that he says, hey, God bless you guys. And they in turn said, God bless you, man. And it can sound a little cheesy because it's so foreign to the way we operate in our workplace today. That we lack that mutual respect and honor for one another. I'm not saying this is easy. I'm not saying this isn't messy. I'm not saying you need to have a devotional time every morning with your employees. What I'm saying is, are you executing the work that the Lord has given you unto him for his glory? Because as we just read, at the end of the day, whether you're an employee or the employer, you both are on equal footing before the Lord, and both of us have to give an account to him of the way that we carry out the responsibilities that he's given us. In closing, kids, students, uh, you may not have a job where you have a boss and you're getting paid for it right now, but that's why God gave you parents because this starts in your home in your young age, is learning how to obey the authority that God has placed over you. We've talked about that for a couple weeks now. Um, obeying your parents is good practice for later in life obeying a boss with a good heart. Remember, Mr. Thrasher said it's not just doing the thing, it's not just obeying, but obeying with a good heart, honoring 
your parents. And so we also need to honor any boss that we have in the future because ultimately we are learning how to obey the Lord and to obey him from our hearts. And so um, here's a good test, kids. If mom and dad asked you this week or they asked you last week, hey, will you rake the leaves? Did you rake the leaves as if Jesus was standing right there and asked you to rake the leaves? You're like, this is so stupid. I don't know what. Hey, they had rake way more than them. Can I be done? Or did you rake the leaves as if Jesus is kind of there and he's kind of raking with you and be like, I'm going to do a really good job. Did you unload the dishwasher as if Jesus was standing right there and asked you to do it? Or was it like, I've already done 10 to 10 other things, Mom. Ask them. I know nobody ever talks like that to their parents. Young adults, some of you are in college or are working your first job. Do you act like you're doing a boss a favor by showing up to work? Not okay. Deuteronomy says that it is God who gives us even the ability to work. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. 1 Corinthians, what do you have that you have not received? Everything that we have is a gift from the Lord. The job that you have, even if it's terrible by your standards, is a gift to you. It's a gift of grace. Uh, when you show up, you are not doing your boss a favor. They are doing you a favor. And God says to work that job as unto him because he is your boss ultimately. And so the heart in which we engage those things uh, says a lot. I keep saying this, but one last thing and then we're done, I promise. Remember, um, as you work as unto the Lord, you are working as unto the Lord. You are being faithful in what he's called you to do. He's called us to honor our bosses' bosses. He's called us to honor our employees. Well, let me be clear that if you are asked to do something in your workplace that is sinful, which can look like a lot of things, unethical, cruel, or against your conscience, you are to honor the Lord by not obeying your boss in those instances. Because your highest aim is you are honoring Christ. And so if anything violates that, uh, you are not bound by Scripture or your relationship with the Lord to honor your boss in those ways. And as we saw, the Lord sees. And so even if you get fired or reprimanded, you have to remind yourself that he is my provider. My boss isn't. I consider this job and the income a blessing, but ultimately, my boss is not my provider. Amen? He is my provider. I'm accountable first and foremost to him. Employers, same thing. You are not to engage in or ask your employees to do anything that is sinful, unethical, cruel, or against their conscience because you are accountable to the Lord as well. And so you're like, man, Matt, this is kind of heavy. This sounds like legalism. The difference between legalism, legalism is you have to do all of these things to make God love you. The gospel is that God loves you and you get to do all of these things. How many of you would love to go to a workplace where you know your boss is going to treat you with dignity and respect and honor? And how many of you bosses would love it if your employees would show up to work and put their cell phones away and do a good, honest eight hours worth of work and give it their full attention and speak to you respectfully? Doesn't that sound like a much better blueprint and plan than what you currently have going? It's not legalism, it's life-giving. When we live into the ways that God created and designed us to work, it's life-giving and it's a, wow, I want that. That is better than the stuff I'm trying to get for myself. Not easy, but the Lord wants to continue to work these hardened attitudes in us so that they come out of us. Let's pray. I want to begin by just inviting you to repent. If the Spirit of God has convicted you in some area today, as we've gone to the Word, if He's convicting you of, of not being faithful in your workplace, of not giving your, your best, 
if maybe for the first time you're seeing like, wow, I didn't realize I was supposed to work my job as if I was working directly for the Lord, maybe that's a light bulb for you. And just acknowledge, say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me that I've been dishonoring you by dishonoring my employer. And employers flip it around. Forgive me, Lord, for dishonoring you by not treating my employees with dignity and respect. And if you've repented, then ask him to change your heart to give you a a bigger perspective on your workplace. His perspective that whatever we do is to be done for his glory. That my relationship with him is to impact every hour of every day of the week. Ask him to change your heart in those ways. And then just receive the filling of his spirit. Scripture tells us to be filled, to be constantly filled with the spirit, to enable us to work as under the Lord. And that's a prayer he will always answer. You say, God, put in me a heart that wants to honor my boss. No matter how he treats me, God, or or she treats me, Lord, I want to work as unto you. Even if I've never acknowledged my, if I get blamed for things, Lord, Help me to work under you. Give me your spirit, Lord. I can't do it in my own strength. For those here that are in an oppressive, um, toxic, ungodly work environment, God, I pray that you would just give them clarity as to what you are asking them to do. For some of them, Lord, you may be asking them to stay in it, to be that bright light for you in the midst of the darkness. Maybe you're calling them to take a step out and to speak to it, to speak some truth um, and to be bold in a Christ-like way to shed some light. Or maybe, Lord, for some, uh, you're showing them that it's time for them to step out and maybe they're terrified of that because they don't know what they would do or if they get another job somewhere else. But Lord, I pray that whatever it is you're asking them to do, by your spirit, you would give them the strength and faith to follow you in that and that they would see your faithfulness. And finally, Lord, for those in need of work and those who are maybe struggling financially, God, right now, I pray that you would give them grace and strength to be faithful where they are, that whatever work they have, whether they're not employed, but they have things to do around the house, that they would do the things that they have to do as unto you, trusting that you are their provider, Lord. Lord, help us as the body to come around them, Lord, to share with them if there are needs. I pray that they would have the humility to reach out and let those be known and that we as the body would see those things and be quick to meet the need and the generosity and grace that you've given to us. And Lord, we trust that that is a testimony to the world as well. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you meddle in our affairs. We thank you that you don't leave us as we are. We thank you that the gospel has uh, implications for every part of our lives. Keep changing us, Lord. It hurts, it's painful, it's exhausting, but yet it's so life-giving and there's nothing sweeter than just being engaged and encountered by you and your work in our lives. We love you, Lord. May we continue to live for your glory alone. Amen. Local church, would you stand? I want to bless you as you go with that Colossians 3 verse one more time. And as always, if you would like prayer, if you need somebody to stand with you, if if this touched on something going on in your workplace or your home, we'd love to pray with you and encourage you. Or if there's something else going on in life, we'd love to pray with you too. I'll be up here to the right. But local church, whatever you do this week, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ as you do. God bless you as you go. We love you. Feel free to hang out. Keep talking to one another. Encourage each other. We'll see you for prayer on Wednesday night on Facebook. Love y'all.